Good morning. Um, again, very quickly, let me uh, tell you all, my name is Clint Rucker, and I'm an assistant district attorney. I work in the office of Mr. Paul L. Howard, Jr., who is the district attorney for Fulton County. And during the course of this trial, which I have been given the responsibility of presenting this case to you, I'll be assisted with, again, Ms. Anna Green and also Phyllis Clark, uh, who is sitting at my table. I have been given the responsibility of presenting to you the case of the state versus Mrs. Dion Andrea Ball. It's B-A-U. G.H. And she is seated in the courtroom right here. And you all will have an opportunity to see the state's bill of indictment in this case. The court has already told you that the indictment in and of itself is not evidence. It is the mechanism by which the state uses to charge people with criminal offenses. And in the state's bill of indictment, Ms. Barr is charged with murder, felony murder, two counts of theft, and financial transaction card fraud. She is charged with those offenses because on August the 8th of 1996, Ms. Barr killed Lance Herndon and stole his computer, one credit card, and some jewelry. And as the court has told you, this is opening statement. This is my opportunity to tell you what it is the evidence in this case will show. Uh, many people have drawn an analogy to opening statement um, by calling it a roadmap. It's kind of the lawyer's way of telling you what to expect, where we're going with the evidence, and what you should be looking for. Opening statement is not evidence. Nothing I say, nothing defense counsel says is evidence. The evidence in this case will come from the witness stand, through the testimony of witnesses, as well as the introduction of evidence, physical and documentary. Now, this case, in this case, the evidence is very clear. And the evidence in this case will show that the version of events given to the police by the defendant before the death of the victim are totally inconsistent with the facts and the circumstances in this case. The evidence in this case will show you that out of the defendant's own mouth, you will be able to determine her guilt. Now, the evidence will show that we recovered this computer after Mr. Herndon's death from the defendant. And we also discovered that she had used his credit card to charge about $3,000 with the furniture the next day. Now, you will soon discover, after you hear some of the witnesses in this case, that although it may sound like a soap opera, it is not. It is a tragic case of a greedy and controlling woman who targets a rich and powerful man. She seduces him with sex. And she attempts to control him throughout the relationship. And when these attempts at control are failing, the evidence will show you that on August the 8th, Ms. Ball 
was very angry. She confronted Mr. Herndon and she killed him. That is really what this case is all about. Now, who was Lance Herndon? He was 41 years old at the time of his death. He stood about 5'10", about 150 pounds, and he originally hailed from New York City. He had been in the Atlanta area about 20 years after a very, very prestigious academic career in undergrad. He moved to Atlanta with the hopes of starting his own company. And a couple of years after he got here, that's exactly what he did. And the name of his company was Access Incorporated. By trade, Mr. Herndon was a computer programmer. He was renowned for doing several things in the Atlanta community. For instance, he set up an ATM system about 10 years prior to his death. And he also was very instrumental in setting up a 911 system for the city of Atlanta. And at the height of his business, it generated in the millions of dollars worth of revenue. He achieved such business acumen that in 1988, he was awarded the National Service Firm of the Year Award by the U.S. Department of Commerce. It was a ceremony that was presented to him at the White House by President Bush. You will hear him described in a lot of different ways. He was generous. He was fun loving. He was almost anal about his own personal cleanliness and organization. You see some evidence about that. And one of the things that you will hear is that with all of the positive things going on in Mr. Herndon's life, like many of us, there were also flaws. And primarily, Mr. Herndon had two that you hear about. He liked women, and he liked to spend money. And it is within these two concepts that he and the defendant connected. Because throughout the course of this trial, you will hear that Mr. Herndon provided the defendant with a great deal. You see, because she also liked money, his. And if somebody would just write down the letter C, we'll come back to it during the course of the trial because you will find that Ms. Ball received cash, She'll tell you hundreds of dollars a week. A car, the 1996 Mercedes Benz, that she was allowed to use and was supposed to return. She received a credit card by which she could make authorized purchases. And from time to time, she was allowed to use his computer which was an IBM laptop, ThinkPad, to do some schoolwork. Now, who is Dion Ball? She was 27 year, years old at the time of this incident. She originally is from Jamaica, Kingston, where she was one of several children in her family. They relocated to Miami in the early 90s. She became a naturalized citizen in 1991. And she met a young man there by the name of Sean Nelson who also hailed from Jamaica. She and Sean got married. They had a daughter, Amanda, shortly thereafter. And they moved to the Atlanta area sometime early 1990s where Ms. Ball continued her education 
Mr. Nelson also continued his education. He was studying to get his pilot's license. He ultimately obtained it and started working for Air Jamaica as one of those guys that flies those little prop planes through the Caribbean, kind of island hopping. And after obtaining his license, he and Amanda relocated to Jamaica, where they lived with his parents, waiting for Ms. Ball to complete her education when she could go back and rejoin the family. And all of this came to a startling collision in April of 1996 when Mr. Herndon had a birthday party in which Ms. Ball attended and was able to make his acquaintance. And it was shortly thereafter that they began their relationship. Now I want to tell you a couple of things about their relationship. As I've already told you, the evidence in the case will show that Mr. Herndon liked women and he liked money. And on these two issues, when the defendant and Mr. Herndon connected, you will see that Mr. Herndon began to have some concerns. You see, because the relationship between he and Ms. Barr started out initially very good. You'll hear evidence that he was very fond of her when they first met. But that changed a short time later in July of 1996, about a month and a half later after they met, when Ms. Barr began trying to check on Mr. Herndon. She began to check on Mr. Herndon because she didn't trust him and he didn't trust her. And this was all confirmed in July when she came to his house unannounced and saw a strange car in the driveway. She went around to the front and she was able to see through the window a naked woman inside Mr. Herndon's house. And she began to beat on the door and call him on the phone in an attempt to get inside. And you'll hear evidence that the police were called to give Ms. Ball a criminal trespassing warning. They asked her to leave the property and not come back. And the evidence will show you that a couple of hours later, she returned where she found the same car parked in the same spot and she began to beat on the door and to call Mr. Herndon trying to get him to come outside. You'll hear that he called the police and Ms. Ball was arrested that night. And it was not something that Mr. Herndon wanted to do. You'll hear that he felt bad about it and that he actually went down the next morning and bailed her out didn't want to see her go to jail. Evidence will show he just wanted her to leave him alone. And the relationship began a roller coaster type effect. It was stormy. It was up and down through the next several weeks. And it all culminated on August the 7th of 1996 when Ms. Ball was attempting to get in touch with Mr. Herndon to discuss the upcoming court date for the criminal trespassing case, which was August the 8th, and to discuss with him the return of the Mercedes-Benz. Now, I also want to tell you that the evidence will show 
that Mr. Herndon, at the time of his death, lived in Roswell, in the North Cliff subdivision, in a mansion about 5,000 square feet. You will hear that although he had an alarm system, it was not used by him. The evidence in this case will show you that although Mr. Herndon and Ms. Ball were scheduled to go to court the same day as the murder, you'll hear evidence that Mr. Herndon never intended to go to court. And that's significant, and you'll hear a great deal about that during the course of the trial. Now, the evidence in this case will show that in the days prior to his death, Sean Nelson had come to Atlanta to visit with his wife and his daughter. He spent approximately three days in Atlanta from August the 5th through August the 7th. And that Ms. Barr dropped him off at the airport on the evening of the 7th, and Mr. Nelson caught a flight, the last flight, back to Jamaica, where he took his daughter home with him. The evidence will show that prior to that time, Ms. Barr had been trying to get in touch with Mr. Herndon, but couldn't, because you see, Sean was here for those couple of days, and they were together the whole time. But on the 7th was her opportunity to get to Mr. Herndon. And the first thing she did when she dropped Sean off at the airport was she started calling him. And the evidence will show that those phone calls are very, very important. You will see how those phone calls will establish the guilt of this defendant. Now, the evidence is going to show that Mr. Herndon, on the 7th, was home from 8 p.m. until after midnight when he was killed. And that earlier that day, his grandmother had flown into Atlanta to visit. If you all will recall, that was right after the Olympic Games. And his grandmother was visiting him for the first time in several years. She was 84 years old at the time and suffered from Alzheimer's. She spent the night with Mr. Herndon on that evening. And you will hear that she was actually in the house when Mr. Herndon was killed. But because the house is so large, she neither saw anything nor heard anything. But the evidence in this case will show that the victim, Mr. Herndon, was on the phone that evening talking and working in his office, which as you'll see, was located in the house on the third level in the basement. Now, the evidence in the case will show that the defendant was at the victim's house on the night he was killed. The evidence will show that the defendant was at the victim's house on the night he was killed and at a time that is consistent with his time of death. The evidence in the case will show that this defendant not only took something when she left, she also left something. And that is very important. And the physical evidence in this case is overwhelming. Now, the facts are 
that Mr. Herndon was actually discovered by his mother. She had come over on the morning of the 8th to visit with Lance's grandmother. And she was the one who actually discovered his body in the master bedroom of the home. And the evidence will show that when he didn't show up for work, folks started looking for him. In fact, his mother noticed that all the cars were still in the garage. That's what caused her to go up to the bedroom. And it was there that she found Mr. Herndon underneath a comforter on his bed. The evidence will show you that Mr. Herndon slept in a king-sized water bed. He was found flat on his back in the nude with his hands placed across his chest as though he were sleeping. There was a pillow that was placed over his face and the comforter was pulled on top. And the evidence in the case will show you that he was beaten about the head and face, struck at least seven times with what the medical examiner will describe for you is a hard, rounded, blunt instrument. It fractured his jaw and his cheekbones. It fractured his skull to the point that it pushed pieces of his skull into his brain, which was what ultimately killed him. And the evidence will show that he never had a chance to even defend himself because there are no defensive wounds anywhere on his body. And you will have an opportunity to see the crime scene photographs. And I want to warn you and tell you that they are graphic in nature. But they won't be shown to you to try to inflame your emotions. They'll be shown to you so that you can see the extent of his injuries. And also, you can see the cold and the callous way in which this defendant left him to die. get a chance to hear from the medical examiner in this case. And he'll describe for you those injuries. Now, you will hear that Mr. Herndon's mother immediately called 911. And she had attempted some minor rescue procedures. But she soon discovered that it was really hopeless. And when the investigation began, Detective William Anastasio from the Roswell Police Department was assigned to the case. And he'll tell you that because of the nature of the homicide, the fact that there were no signs of any forced entry to the house, the fact that there were no signs of a struggle within the bedroom, the fact that there were no defensive wounds and there was nothing obviously taken from the house, that they began to focus on the people who were immediately in Mr. Herndon's life. And that through the course of the investigation, he was able to systematically eliminate those folks and account for their whereabouts all except Ms. Ball. And the evidence in this case will show you that the police actually spoke to Ms. Ball three times. And that on the third time, about a week after Mr. Herndon's death, they thought it prudent to videotape the interview. 
It's about an hour and a half long. And during the trial, you will have an opportunity to see that videotaped interview. And what you will find is that it is filled with lies, falsehoods, and just some things that just don't make sense. And the evidence in this case will show that as the investigation progressed, the case got stronger. Because in Ms. Ball's statement to the police, she maintains that she was not at the home of Mr. Herndon on that night. But she has an explanation for why she has his computer and his credit card. And I want you to pay very close attention to this videotape statement. I promise you it will be riveting. In fact, when we get to that part in the trial, I don't even want you to blink because you might miss something. But as the, as the investigation proceeded, you will hear that Special Agent Sam House from the GBI processed the crime scene. He was able to take some physical evidence from the body of Mr. Herndon and send it to the crime lab where they performed some tests. And what we discovered was this, that underneath Mr. Herndon's fingernails was DNA. We also discovered that on his body, his nude and bloody body, there were head hairs and pubic hairs from a female. During the course of the investigation, the head and pubic hair of Ms. Ball was taken, as well as her blood to compare to the DNA sample underneath his fingernails. And the experts from the crime lab will tell you that they were able to match the DNA under the fingernails of Mr. Herndon back to Dion Ball. They were able to match the head hair found on his body and in his bed back to Ms. Ball. And they were able to match the pubic hair found on his chest back to Ms. Ball. And you will hear that when confronted with the inconsistency in her story, the first thing she did was she ran to Jamaica, where you will hear evidence from Sean's mother, Barbara, that two days after her videotaped statement to the police, she actually confessed to Barbara that she had been in Mr. Herndon's house that night and that she had had sex with him. Two things totally inconsistent with what she had told the police who were investigating the death of Mr. Herndon. Now, there are gonna be a lot of witnesses in this case. And you'll have a chance to hear from each and every one of them. And because there will be so many lies told by, Mr. by Ms. Ball, you will find that she lies about little things, you'll find that she lies about big things, you'll find that she lies about things that she doesn't have a reason to lie about at all. But something that I want to tell you, and something that I want to prepare you for in opening, is how to receive the state's evidence. Because what you will hear from initially will be friends and family members that will tell you the whereabouts of Mr. Herndon on the day prior to his death. And it's very important that you listen very carefully to those witnesses because they will give you what I have termed little nuggets. Little things 
that you should make a mental note, perhaps jot down on your pad, because you see, after they testify, you'll hear from Detective Anastasio and you'll get a chance to see the videotape. And you'll be able to compare the facts told to you by the witnesses versus the lies told to the police by Ms. Ball. And it is out of those two things that you will be able to determine her own guilt if you just listen to what she said. She'll tell you the whole story. Now, one of the things that you will not hear from in this case is an eyewitness. There were no eyewitnesses to this crime. And although the investigation in this case was thorough and it was exhaustive, you will not see the murder weapon. The police were not able to recover it. But the medical examiner will be able to give you some very good ideas about what could possibly have caused his injuries. And it will be the inconsistent words of the defendant and the inconsistent actions of the defendant that will prove her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the judge has already um, instructed you all about the procedures that are going to take place during the course of the trial. The sheriff's deputy has passed out some pads and some pencils. One of the things that I'm going to encourage you all to do is to take notes, to jot down just a little something about each and every witness. Because what you will find is that once you get back in the jury room during deliberations, it will help you refresh your recollection about what happened throughout the course of the trial. Because you see, one of the things about trials is this. You won't get a chance to have the tape back in the jury room with you. You don't get a chance to get a transcript of what the witnesses say. You get one shot. So I encourage you that when we get to those important parts of the trial, that you just make yourself a little note. I guarantee you it'll help you when you get in the back. Now, the evidence in this case will be clear and it will be overwhelming. And at the end of the presentation of the state's case, I'll get a chance to come back and speak to you again. And at that time, I will ask you to return a verdict that speaks the truth about what happened to Mr. Herndon on August the 8th of 1996. I will ask you to return a verdict of guilty against this defendant on each and every count in the state's bill of indictment. Thank you. All right, Mr. Katz, Mr. Quinn. Thank you, Judge. I'll take a look at the other The Adam Ball, the Adam, would you stand up? You've heard a lot of bad things about her from the mouth of the prosecutor. The sole issue in this case is can this man prove you beyond a reasonable doubt that this 110-pound woman made love to a man and why he lay sleeping, smashed the life out of him. Can he prove that beyond a reasonable doubt? That's the issue. And it's important to stay focused on the issue. Because as I listened to that opening statement, I heard a lot of noise, but I didn't hear about much real evidence. I heard a lot of heat, but I didn't hear a lot of light. 
And before this case is over, folks, we're going to put you in the light business, not the heat business. You don't do it with a lot of fancy graphs. You do it with some common sense and a realization of the solemnity of the charges against her and the gravity of the burden that's on the state. They talked about Lance Herman, and they talked about my client. It is true that they had an affair. That part is absolutely true, and it's uncontested. Lance Herndon gave her a Mercedes, true and uncontested. Like the prosecutor told you, Lance Herndon gave her credit cards, true and uncontested. Now, how they can say, on the one hand, he gave her credit cards, and they like to spend money together, and then on the other hand say, she stole the credit cards, contested, contested and untrue. Lance Herndon was a very complicated man. Since his murder over six years ago, the state still, this is six years ago, this woman has been laboring under these accusations, under these innuendos, for six years of her life. And to this day, the state cannot tell you a time of death for Lance Hunt. They cannot tell you a murder weapon that killed Lance Herndon. They have no fingerprints of my client. They have no blood evidence related to my client. What they do have is a pubic hair, or two pubic hairs, and a head hair. And there's no question that the two are in a sexual relationship. What he forgot to tell you is that there were other pubic hairs on that same bloody body and that same bloody bed that were unidentified, not hers. What he forgot to tell you is that there were head hairs, not hers. To this day, the state, although they suspect her, and want to accuse her, they don't know if Lance Herndon was murdered by one of his other girlfriends, and I'll tell you in a minute, by a jealous husband of any number of women he was dating, whether he was killed by somebody that was mad at him in conjunction with his business, in conjunction with his nightclub, in conjunction with his loans, they don't know. What they're going on is primarily a pubic hair from some woman who says, we've had sex, who has said, I was over there two nights before. But they still don't know who the other pubic hairs, who, they, who it comes from, or the head hairs. Now let me tell you a little bit about the cast of characters that you will hear about. This becomes important because the state's timeline, Mr. Rucker gave you some times, and he's got some fancy posters, my golly, I don't know how much it costs the state. There's all these fancy posters with all these timelines and all these telephone calls that I presume sometime you all will hear it. But let's talk a little bit about the source of the timeline. Let's talk a little bit about the source of the state's information. Let's talk just a moment and pause briefly to discuss the source of the state's evidence. And when I say these things, I do not mean any disrespect to Lance Herman. Lance Herman was a human being. He did not deserve to be murdered. And there's no question that somebody murdered him. I think Mr. Rucker is correct that all of us have good points in our bad points. But Lance Herndon, as the state has brought out, 
was sexually addicted. It cost him his marriage. When his wife, Janine, found naked pictures of a woman named Talana Caraway. Talana Caraway broke up Lance Herman's marriage. It wasn't her alone, but she was the last straw or one of the straws. Talana Caraway had recently come back into Lance's life shortly before his death. She was given a credit card. My client was given a credit card. Talana worked for long. In fact, the prosecutor pointed to my client and said she was in the house the very night he died. Well, Talana Carroll was in the house. You got it. The very night he died. And she could just as easily be sitting there as my client. Talana Carraway says, yes, I had sex with Lance, but it was only as friends. And I left the house at exactly 10.37. And we were only friends, although we had the sex, not that night, she said, but we were friends. We had sex the previous Wednesday, she said. But I left at exactly 10.37. And I went home and I got a call at exactly 11.29. How she knows exactly, I guess we can ask her when she testifies as the state brings her in. And she says in that phone call, Lance Herndon asked me to marry him at 1129, exactly 11. So she said. But Lance was a busy fellow that night. Because not only is he in a sexualized relationship with Dion, and not only is he in a sexualized relationship with Talana Carraway, but his real girlfriend, who has been out of town, is coming back into town. And it's about to get a little crowded around the home place. The real girlfriend is Kathy Collins. And Lance had been going with her for a long, long time. Every stick of clothes that woman owned was in Lance's house. And Kathy Collins comes in from out of town. And she claims that she goes to a restaurant, the Embers. And instead of rushing over to see her sweetie, Lance Herndon, she says, I went to a restaurant where I sat with my niece for two hours. And she has the seven dollar bill to prove it. Unstamped is the time. At the Embers restaurant. And she says, I didn't go to the home that night. But she provides some of this timeline that the state uses to say my client's a liar and that my client is a murderer. It could just as easily be any number of people sitting in that chair. Because if having sex with Lance Herndon was a was the equivalent of being his murderer and murderous, then the list would grow mighty long, folks.
furthermore, as we understand the state's case, and based on some of the things Mr. Walker said, the state will be trying to convince you that Lance Herndon and this woman were either on the ends or on the eyes. They said it both ways. And to cover his bases, he'll say it's up and down. But that somehow she got into his house unobserved without a key. That's step one. Step two, that she makes love to him. I don't believe these things happen, but this is the state's case that I understand. That she makes love to him. And then somehow, she decides, after having sex with a man, to smash his brains in. And then she decides to unplug the clock. And then she decides to unplug the radio, all without getting fingerprints on anything, all without getting blood on herself. And then she decides to take the rings off the man's fingers. And then she decides to take the necklace off of him. She's got the necklace, the rings, the clock, the radio, the telephones unplugged, never getting blood on anything or on her. And then she says, I need that computer. So then with all this stuff, she's going to run downstairs, going to get the computer. And oh gosh, the credit card, back upstairs. Go back upstairs, get the credit card. Credit card, the rings, the necklace. Let her put that comfort back on his head. All the while, never getting any fingerprints. And then she leaves. And somehow, she ditches that murder weapon. I forgot that. And all the other things, the rings, the necklace, unplugged telephone, murder weapon. Gets rid of that somehow escapes this crime of passion, goes back to her house, oh, God. barely made it out of that, and the very next thing she does, picks up Lance's credit card and says, I think I better order $2,700 worth of furniture on it so the police will really know to come looking for me. Six years she's labored under this, and I'll tell you something, all the fancy charts in the world won't make a case where there is no case. And then when the police do come to talk to her, she said, well, wait a minute, I've got his computer, and volunteers that. It's not, then later they went to get a search warrant for her. But she says, I got the man's computer right here and she gives it to him. So it wouldn't be enough to use his credit card. The very next day after she killed the man, she wouldn't want her to volunteer to the police, I've got his computer for her. So she's charged with murder, which she didn't commit. She's charged with credit card fraud. When the state's already told you in the opening statement that she's allowed to use the credit card, she's allowed Excuse me, she's charged with stealing that computer. But the evidence is going to be she was the only one that was allowed to use that computer out of the home. You know, there was another lady, Holly Struber, that was used it day in and day out. But I think the evidence is going to be unquestioned that she was allowed to use the computer many, many times. Now, the state's come back to that. When Lance gave it to her, he gave it to her with the case. And this time, it didn't have the case. So therefore, she must be a murderer. Well, you'll see the computer. They've got it somewhere in this bag of evidence somewhere. And it's like a Sherman tank. It doesn't need no stinking case. And that doesn't prove anything. The issue is not whether there's a case on the computer. The issue is not whether she got a Mercedes Benz, whether she's going to give up that Mercedes for a Ford. There's been some suggestion of that. 
The issue is not whether she was going to buy the land or whether she was going to go to Sean. She had been separated. None of those are issues. And I'll tell you something else. It's not an issue as to whether she had sex with Lance Herndon an hour before he died, a day before he died. It's not really an issue whether she had sex at his house and lied about it or at her house and just met with him. Those aren't the issues. Those are camouflage. And I'll grant you they could be circumstantial evidence. You'll have to decide. The issue, the issue, which Mr. Walker didn't talk much about, is did this woman pick up a murder weapon of some unidentified type, never found, and kill the man with it? That's what I want to hear. Now, I want to talk about the murder weapon a minute. I honestly, as I sit here, stand here today, I don't know what today's murder weapon is going to be. At first, it was a tire tube. And Anastasia was running around, he's the detective in this case, with a tire tube. He couldn't find one in her, with the trunk of one of her cars, so he says, that must be. But since it's gone, he goes out into the hardware store and buys one. And then the medical examiner must have told him, no, sir, it's got to be a flat object. So, well, we get the tire tool. So, years later, years, somebody says there used to be a wrench on that stairs. And I don't remember seeing that wrench a few years ago when I was in the house. And I'm telling you, this case is pitiful enough where they run out to the hardware store and buy a stinking wrench. And then take that over to the medical examiner, Dr. Sperry. Yeah, it's a wrench like that. Bottom line, they don't know. I don't know. They don't know who killed him. I don't know. Wasn't that way. And he can stand up here and disrespect her and call her a liar all he wants. He's got to prove that she killed this man, and he can't do it. If this case started to evaporate, they do not have to prove motive. Do not have to prove motive. If I'm walking down the street and I shoot somebody, then that's murder and it's on me whether I have motive or not. But it always is a logical thing to have motive. And in any human relationship, you could look around and find some money. But the motive they have come up with is this criminal trespass case. And I want to tell you what to look for about that. Dion Ball has now graduated from Georgia State. But during the time that she was involved with Lance, she was studying finance at Georgia State. And so she had a job as administrative coordinator for MARTA. And she would go to work and come get off at three and then go to college. Well, she had a test. And so on the day of July 10th, I believe it is, of 1996, she had her book bags and some of the materials she needed for her test over at Lance's. And she went over there to Lance's. And Lance was in bed with his real girlfriend, Kathy Collins. And Dion bangs on the door, and it is late, and it probably was not great to go over there, but that's what she did. And she's banging on the door. Bang, bang, bang. Lance, you'll hear from Kathy Collins, I think the state intends to call her. Kathy Collins says, that must be a woman. Bang. A man doesn't bang like that. How she would know that, I don't know. 
but Kathy Collins must have suspected a woman. But Lance won't get up and go down to the door to see if it's a man or a woman or who it is. But he does call the police. And the police come and they find Dion and the police say, what are you doing out here banging on the door? You're disturbing people. And she says, I want my books. My boy, this is my boyfriend's house, and I need my book bag and my books for a testimony. And the officer says, look, just cool it, let's go. So she goes. She comes back early, comes back five o'clock in the morning. Now, if she were accused of being stubborn, we'd plead guilty to that. But she wanted her book back. So she comes back, she's back on the door. Lance is in bed with Kathy again. Lance calls the police. And this time, Lance knows that it is her. It's debatable the first time whether she, he knew who it was. But this time, Lance clearly knows that it's Dion Ball. So as only Lance could do, he turns to Kathy Collins and says, they say it's Dion Ball, a lady named Dion Ball. I've never heard of a lady named Dion Ball. I don't know any Dion Ball. Lance forgets to mention that he'd been having sex with Dion for quite a while. Forgets to mention to Kathy Collins that I bought her a Mercedes. So when Dion has come back the second time, it's about five in the morning, somewhere in that area. Lance refuses to come to the door and call the cops. She decides to wait for the folks that work in the office to come in. So she's laying down in the car with a blanket over. An officer comes up. The officer is given a statement, and it goes something like this. At first, he says she's trying to hide under those blankets. And then a little bit later in the statement, he says, and then when I finally got her attention and she knew I was there, she got up and said she wanted her book back. I told her she had been told to leave, and I placed her under arrest. Not Lance Herndon placing her under arrest. The cop placed her under the rest. Meanwhile, Lance Herndon is upstairs with Kathy Collins. She is taken off to jail. As soon as Lance gets Kathy Collins out of there, he goes down and bails her out of jail. And this is the motive for the murder. As the state would happen. He bails her out of jail. After Lance was killed, Detective Anastasia seized my client's tape machine or her answer machine. And it had an Anastasia transcribed seven messages from Lance Herndon on the day of July 10th, which is the day the state contends the big rift between Lance and Miss Ball. Seven messages where Lance called and left messages. It's undisputed that they over out, undisputed that he took her to his home. With respect to those seven messages, even though it's a piece of evidence that favors me, I suspect there's, there's a screw up there. The messages, although the police say were on the 10th, it's not clear to me that they all relate to things on the 10th. And maybe we can work with that as the case goes on. But what is clear 
is one of the messages very distinctly is Lance Herndon saying, what's all this about the Roswell police? I got your message. What's all this about the Roswell police? As if Lance doesn't know anything about it. But then Lance, after bailing her out of jail, continues to date her, continues to talk with her. They take their kids to the park. She's got Amanda comes in from out of town. He's got a young son, Harrison his name. And Lance and Miss Wall take the kids out. They date. They have telephone contact. He prepares to go with her to Las Vegas. On July 22nd, he wires her $350. And just to put this in chronological order, July 10th is the date of the criminal trespass. July 22nd is the date of a $350 wire from Lance. On July 31st, we're way down the road from that criminal trespass after he bonded her out. Lance wires her $720 and is insistent, is insistent that she get a home security system for herself. On the day before Lance Herndon is murdered, she signs the contract to get that home security system. That date is July 7th excuse me, August 7th, 1996. So as this case was being prepared, the big issue from both sides was the significance or lack thereof of the criminal trespass case. Because the state, as they have done, urges that that's tension that that's tension. Don't mention that it's just a misdemeanor anyway. But it's tension between the two, so the state continues. Last Friday, last Friday, six years after this murder, four years after my client has been indicted, We are served with a supplemental police report. From the police officer that arrested her for the criminal trespass. His name is Stanfield. And Stanfield's supplemental report that we're given for the first time last Friday and had been written in 1996 to be more specific August 2nd 1996 a few days before this impending court date on August 8th Lance Herndon called Officer Stanford. He said, I, Your Honor, I will object at this point based on the court's prior ruling regarding this issue. No, there's been no ruling on this issue. Regarding what Mr. Herndon said? There's been some hearsay you tried to get, and he's ruled out, but this is to explain conduct. If he wants to charge us, drop. This here, I'm going to object, Your Honor. 
Your Honor, is, it pro is it proper to comment in front of the jury regarding the court's prior ruling on hearsay statements coming from Mr. Herndon? All right, well, I don't really objection. I just didn't run involved in that. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. It's it, it, it didn't come to light until last Friday. Our hearing was um, uh, two weeks ago. So, I mean, <laughs> this was never discussed. Plus, Your Honor, that was romantic hearsay as opposed to. The okay, well, I understand. I'm Thank really, you, Judge. So, go ahead. I'm sure his purpose is not to get me off track. I'm going to object, Your Honor. Well, well, I got listen, all. Mr. Quinn, don't make any editorial comments. You're almost finished. We're going to take a break, ladies and gentlemen, just a minute, and then we'll start the evidence. So go ahead, Mr. Quinn. Here it is. Straight out. August 2nd, 1996, a few days before the pending criminal arraignment. Lance Herndon calls Officer Stanfield and says, I want the charges dropped. She has learned her lesson. And Stanfield tells her, well, you didn't bring the charges. I didn't bring the charges. So the charges never did get dropped. But Lance called with the specific request that they be dropped. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been times for each of you, there will be times for each of you in your personal lives where I'm going to object to argument. <coughs> Don't argue, Mr. No, Queen. I'm not going to argue. I was just going to tell them this is a solemn job. Is that okay? Okay, we'll just tell them it's a solemn job and let's, go, let's move on. This is a solemn job. This lady's been charged with murder, and I would submit to you that nothing is more important than your decision in this case. I think it's a fair statement that it will affect her the rest of her life. The judge tells you the standard by which you judge the state's case. Judge will tell you that the burden, and the prosecutor has told you this, that the burden is on the state to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And when I say the case, I mean the case of murder. I'm not talking about a case of not having affairs or lying. I'm talking about the case of murder. The judge will tell you that that case, and that's the case we're here to try, the burden is on a state beyond a reasonable doubt. The state will tell you, excuse me, the judge will tell you at the end of the trial that mere speculation is not sufficient. Mere conjecture is not sufficient. Well, I'm going to object. Okay, that's the same objection. At the end of this case, ladies and gentlemen, after you've heard the instructions from the judge, not from me, not from the prosecutor. I'm going to stand before you and I'm going to ask you to acquit this ball on every single one of these charges, to acquit her for two reasons. One, she's not guilty. And two, the state has no case. They've got suspicions, but they've got no proof. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a 10-minute break, and we're going to eat lunch. We're going to break for lunch at 12.30, so y'all get some water, stretch, and we're going to start in 10 minutes, and then we'll break at 12.30.